When you hear the name Wellington, what face pops into your mind? I'd imagine for a lot of us, it isn't Arthur Wellesley's, but Christopher Plummer's. Or what about Napoleon, or Caesar, Hitler, Lee, even with lesser known and less significant figures of history, uh, say Bannister Tarleton, Admiral Pellew, or Lieutenant Bromhead, films and other media have an extraordinary ability to connect us with historical figures, leaving us with a lasting impression of who exactly those individuals were. And sometimes that's great. A strong, well-researched performance can really help us to understand these people on their own terms, who they were, what made them tick. But a poor portrayal can also very, very easily give us false impressions, with overly idealized or demonized caricatures standing where people ought to be in history. And oftentimes in popular culture, and deeply unfortunately, it seems that our interpretation of what kinds of people these figures were hinges more on those popular media portrayals than on historical reality. Indeed, I can think of exceedingly few historical characters that I think were portrayed both entertainingly and accurately on film, and honestly, the best examples in my mind also conveniently happen to be the figures that I know the least about. It often seems to come down to an actor's ability with a script that they were given rather than a genuine reflection of who a historical figure really was. Take the case of this video's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends, and Sir Galaroth, the Guardian of the Arcane Keep. He was given the job of guarding certain arcane knowledge, but naturally the majority of those seeking it out found themselves deeply unworthy, their merits being termed in the most reliable of moral indicators, of course, being combat. And naturally, as those heroes failed, they didn't take the time to appreciate the complexity of Sir Galaroth's job and his character, they just made him out to be a villain. At first, the Arcane Keep attempted to distract people from the Galaroth controversy by launching a program of bread and circuses in the form of a Halloween update. New and bigger rewards, PvP tournaments, special fragment events to get brand new legendary champions, and more. Simultaneously, they launched a sort of stimulus package where any newcomers could use a link they provided, and I'll be sure to cite the same link in the description, of course, uh, or they could scan a QR code, which would allow those newcomers to then receive some 200,000 silver, an experience boost, an energy refill, an energy chart, even a new hero by the name of Chanaru. All of that, and the only thing that you, or that, I mean, they needed to do was to click on the link in the description down below. Now, did these distractions and this stimulus uh, do much to improve Galaroth's reputation? Well, you'll just have to find out what you think of him yourself. Thank you to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. And now back to the topic at hand. Now, anyone can complain about films, but what would I do differently? How do I propose that we portray these historical figures in a way that is simultaneously compelling and entertaining while keeping honest to an historical reality? I mean, is that sort of thing even possible? Well, the answer is yes, absolutely it is possible. And today I want to give you an amazing example of how we can do exactly that. The example is Master and Commander, the far side of the world. Now, if you're familiar with this film, you know that it follows an adventure of Captain Jack Aubrey and his crew, all of whom are fictionalized characters. It's a real setting, a Royal Navy ship in the Napoleonic era, but all of the people and even the precise situation within that setting are made up. Now inherently, that kind of story is far easier to tell because while yes, they are still held to the standards of material culture and things like that, the writers have many more creative freedoms than if they were to be putting words directly into the mouths of real life people. So how is this relevant for our discussion today if we're talking about real life people in film? Well, because like a great spirit of sorts, a very real name is looming over this fictionalized story. Excuse me, sir, but Mr. Blakeney said that you served under Lord Nelson. But with Nelson. To Lord Nelson. To Lord Nelson. Lord Nelson. Vice Admiral Horatio Lord Nelson, hero of the Nile, martyr at Trafalgar, and savior of his nation and the free world. And if perhaps my language seems a little strong to you, know that for vast swaths of British society during this time period, it probably isn't anywhere near strong enough, especially for the men of the Royal Navy. Nelson was a father to the Navy, a hero to his people. 
when he was killed in the battle which decisively won British naval supremacy for the next hundred years, give or take a few, even the king was claimed to have in despair said, we have lost more than we have gained. This guy was, and honestly pretty much still is, the ultimate example of hero worship. So how on earth do you even approach giving a character of such gravitas the portrayal that they deserve? Well, the answer is, you, you kind of don't. As I said, the name of Nelson looms heavily, if perhaps also briefly, in this film. But the man himself never makes an appearance. The first time his name is mentioned comes after a disastrous battle with a French frigate, which has left the British in rather dire straits. Among the wounded is Lord Blakeney, a young midshipman with notable family connections, who recently underwent the traumatic experience of an amputation. And Captain Jack Aubrey visits him below decks with a gift in a bid to provide some comfort. The captain is clearly a little uncomfortable with the situation, but still he's able to find some shared interest with the boy through the heroic acts of the famed naval hero. And this is the first we see of Nelson's name. The victories of Nelson, gallant British hero. It has all of his major battles in it and, and some very fine illustrations. Thank you, sir. A sharp distinction to the blood and terror of just a few minutes prior, this is a glorious portrayal of a man beyond mere mortality. This is a portrayal of a hero. And here we have the perfect opportunity for this film to ruin the moment completely. You could have a flashback of Aubrey fighting alongside Nelson to see some random famous actor shouting some indiscernible command to swelling music as he looks dramatically towards the camera and probably winks or something silly like that. All in the effort, as usual, to add more cheap action shots and to be able to show Nelson himself, ooh ah, in the trailer for the film. But no, no, instead what we get is this beautiful, this this real moment, which is simultaneously humanizing Aubrey while reaffirming the manner in which many Britons of the Napoleonic era envisioned Nelson as an almost ethereal, heroic figure. Did you ever meet Lord Nelson, sir? I had the honor and privilege of serving with him at the Nile, a great victory. You can find it in here, actually. Page 135, if I'm not mistaken. May I beg you to tell me what kind of man he is? You should read the book. I will, sir. Thank you. Far from putting words into Nelson's mouth or casting him in some specific light through modern eyes, this is the kind of writing, I think, that takes Nelson on his own historical terms. It's portraying him how the vast, vast majority of people would have seen him which is to say, in terms of mythos more than any literal fashion. How appropriate then that the scene ends with exactly one such image, as Blakeney flips past the page of some heroic act to a portrait of the man. Because while we in our photorealistic age may be used to seeing public figures warts and all, for Blakeney, this is his Nelson. For millions of people, this is precisely who Nelson is. No artistic license is being taken here, no words being put into Nelson's mouth, no makeup or fake accents or any of it. This is just the man as he was truly known. Lord Nelson is mentioned at greater length later on, after the British ship, having been repaired and resupplied, once more is taking to the hunt. Naturally, there is fear and apprehension at the coming of battle, and many must undoubtedly in such times be asking themselves whether they will be capable of standing up to what England expects of them. But still, these men are jolly jack tars, and Captain Aubrey keeps a fine table where he might entertain his officers with drink and song. <laughs> Gentlemen, to wives and to sweethearts. Wives and sweethearts. May they never meet. <laughs> <laughs> Though the mood does change a bit when, once again, the name of the hero is evoked. Excuse me, sir, but Mr. Blakeney said that you served under Lord Nelson at the Nile. Indeed. I was a young lieutenant, not much older than you are now. Mr. Pullings, 
Mr. Pullins was a sniveling midshipman, still yearning for hearth and home. <laughs> Again, Aubrey is perhaps a little shy to discuss such matters as personal past experience uh, in favor of drink and removing one's mind from reality as he attempts to deflect this with a bit of a lighthearted joke. And again, that's a beautiful moment for humanizing himself and the crew while simultaneously making the name of Nelson feel so much more meaningful and weighty. But still, the younger lad persists. I mean, after all, how could you not, being only one layer removed from the hero himself? Did you meet him, sir? Can you tell me what he's like? I have had the honor of dining with him twice. He spoke to me on both occasions. And here is where things get dangerous. We're a level removed from the man, yes, but now the filmmakers have put themselves in a position to give an actual and very direct perspective about Nelson and who he was, what kind of man he was. This is an opportunity for the filmmakers to insert their modern thoughts, their modern interpretations into the mouths of historical figures, which is oh so unfortunately common in period pieces. This is the sort of pivotal moment that can ruin how we perceive a historical figure, or at the very least, cast a very powerful and very specific light on them. Think of the Patriot and Mel Gibson saying, The Gates is a damn fool. So let's lean in here and see exactly what kind of light is being cast on this titanic figure of Lord Nelson. He always said in battle, never mind the maneuvers, just go straight at him. Some would say not a great seaman, but a great leader. Yeah. He's England's only hope if old Boney intends to invade. Yeah. Now every response is appropriate to the character that says it, whether it be youthfully excitable or more callous yet respectful. But alongside the replies being deeply appropriate, I think, they're also all very plain. These aren't offering anything truly new. They aren't adding any grand historiographic insight to the man. He always said to go straight at him isn't really that far off from an actual quote we have from Nelson, being no captain can do very wrong if he places his ship alongside that of the enemy. It's a very Nelsonian thing to say, and obviously so. Uh, perhaps the quote provided here is a little brash sounding, but this is also very obviously a young man's flawed, potentially, recollection of the sorts of things that Nelson was saying, which again, we know were along these lines. To the point where I very much believe that that's just a direct quote, just one that I'm not particularly familiar with or aware of. Meanwhile, other individuals who haven't met him are providing even more general statements. Not a great seaman, but a great leader. Again, very appropriate thing for this character to say, but also nothing new. Nelson got seasick for crying out loud. Very, definitely not a very good seaman in that way. And yet still, he captivated the hearts of an entire nation. What man could be described as a better leader in this particular setting? And finally, he's England's only hope if old Boney plans to invade. From the captain of Marines, again, not only a common sentiment of the time, but a one which would later be proven a very sound take on Britain's situation. It was absolutely the case. This is an element I think that's absolutely key. We aren't getting any edgy, pseudo-historical nonsense here on the part of the filmmakers, uh, you know, trying to make the historical agent more relatable or some such. Uh, we aren't even venturing into the murkier waters of new historiography, which might be controversial. And because of that, because we're keeping things so simple, the room for big mistakes to be made on the part of the writers is an awfully lot smaller than it otherwise would have been. You might say that we're dealing here more in interpretations, how people of the time are conceiving of Nelson rather than of the man himself directly. We're not getting any sort of insight into his personality, other than the fact that he was very direct as a commander, or anything that you can only get through the eyes of someone who knew him, something like that. This is all known information. These are known quantities. And in providing that kind of information, not only are the writers being incredibly honest with how these sorts of conversations may have been carried out, but they're also able to use that historical icon, that hero, as a catalyst for further exploring the personalities and traits of their own fictional characters. 
More simply put, this is using the history to expand upon and build up the fictional story rather than cutting corners or using so-called artistic license in an attempt to develop characters. It's putting the history first and the story is being based around it, not the other way around. And perhaps the greatest and most memorable moment of the filmmakers using exactly that method comes when the risk is at its absolute highest. Sir, might we press you for uh, an anecdote? The first time that he spoke to me, I shall never forget his words. I remember it like it was yesterday. The room is hushed. Aubrey is about to tell the story, the moment that the hero spoke directly to him. No evading, no going around the corners. This is direct words from Lord Nelson. Ah, uh, what extraordinary, what otherworldly, near divine wisdom might we be about to receive, even if indirectly, from the man himself. He leant across the table and looked me straight in the eye. And he said, Aubrey. May I trouble you for the salt? <laughs> I've always tried to say it exactly <laughs> as he did. <laughs> it's a classic moment of Aubrey's humor, another glimpse into who he is as a character, yes, but it's also a humanizing moment for Nelson. This moment grounds the hero in reality very solidly, yet without demeaning him or lessening his heroic status. It will not change anyone's image of the man, and it's a purely neutral statement. And what's more, in that we see Aubrey's clear love of telling the story, trying to get the accent right, and his comment that he would never forget what Nelson said to him, we're also getting that very real sense of magnitude from it all. There's even a blatant acknowledgement that Aubrey's attempt at the accent is probably laughably bad. It works so well and yet so personally. And then we come to the second story. The second time, the second time he told me a story about how someone offered him a boat cloak on a cold night. And he said, no, he didn't need it, but he was quite warm. His zeal for king and country kept him warm. I know it sounds absurd, and were it from another man, he would cry out, oh, what pitiful stuff, and dismiss it as mere enthusiasm. But with Nelson, you felt your heart glow. And that moment, I think, without need for explanation, is simply beautiful. At least so long as you respect Nelson and don't, you know, deem the entire thing as tosh yourself. However, it must be noted that this is also, I think, the worst part of Nelson's portrayal. Though, to be fair, it's still way better, infinitely better, uh, than most films ever accomplish. The story that Aubrey tells here, you see, isn't entirely fictional, or at least it isn't entirely made up, as there is an equivalent that exists during this time period. It's just that the quote is a little off, and unfortunately, it does cast a different light on Nelson than the real quote does. They're both good lights, to be sure. They're not too different, but they are still somewhat different because the words are different. The real story that Aubrey is referencing here came from around the time of the Battle of Copenhagen. Nelson was on land about the business of destroying some captured vessels which couldn't be sent back to Britain when he received word that his commander at the time was moving out with a large portion of the fleet to engage an enemy. Nelson, of course, couldn't abide being on land if a battle was going to be waged. The following account of the incident is quoted from a letter by Mr. Brierly, master of the ship Bologna, dated the 19th of April, 1801. The moment he received the account, he ordered a boat to be manned, and without even waiting for a boat cloak, though you must suppose the weather pretty sharp here at this season of the year, and having to row about 24 miles with the wind and current against him, jumped into her and ordered me to go with him. All I have ever seen or heard of him could not half so clearly prove to me the singular and unbounded zeal of this truly great man. And quick aside here, does that language sound familiar to you at all? A master tactician and a man of singular vision. If you want the language in your historical film to sound appropriate, especially when you're talking about such iconic figures, 
pull from the primary sources. It, it not only makes it so much more historically accurate, it makes it seem so much more real, so much more believable as well. In any case, back to the letter. His anxiety in the boat for nearly six hours, lest the fleet should have sailed before he got on board one of them, is beyond all conception. I will quote some expressions in his own words. It was extremely cold, and I wished him to put on a greatcoat of mine which was in the boat. No, I am not cold. My anxiety for my country will keep me warm. Do you think the fleet has sailed? I should suppose not, my lord. If they are, we shall follow them to Kalskrona in the boat, by God. Another beautiful thing about pulling quotes and stories from the time period itself, of course, is that regardless of whether those stories are true or not, doesn't really matter too much because they were obviously being spoken of and spread around during the time period itself. Regardless of their objective truth, they are still in some capacity historically accurate. Though, yes, it is unfortunate that the quote is a little bit off, especially as it's being posed as coming directly from Nelson himself telling Aubrey the story. Uh, unless we're going to believe that Aubrey is misremembering it or lying, but I think that's a little harder to get away with here. Um, I think it would have been better accuracy-wise to have it being told to Aubrey as a second or third hand story. Um, then we could, you know, justify it a bit more. But at the end of the day, even with all that, this is a small sin, I think, compared to how the whole scene is being handled. And at the very least, it isn't terribly far off from the reality if, again, perhaps Nelson is still being cast in a little bit of a different light, him saying anxious versus, you know, zeal for king and country or what have you. Though, to be fair, in the same sense, the quote being anxiety for his country doesn't quite make as much sense without the full context, you know, unless you have Aubrey telling the story of like, oh yeah, he's trying to make it to a battle before it ended, yada yada yada, he's worried about his country. Whereas zeal and all that, it's far more broadly applicable. Like, we don't have to have the context. We can just imagine Nelson standing quietly on a quarter deck one day, and the quote there still works. It's much more broadly applicable here. I mean, you know me. I'd always love to see the greater context added, uh, again, using history to enhance the story as opposed to trying to worm around it to make your plot work. But certainly, this entire piece could have been far far worse. I think this is overall done pretty well for being the worst element of the portrayal. Indeed, if this is the worst element of Master and Commander's portrayal of Admiral Nelson, which I think it is, then you've clearly got an amazing film, which incidentally you do. So we have a quip from Stephen, our academic foil and the companion to Aubrey, although I feel that there isn't much to say about it that hasn't already been said. Well then, he would seem to be the exception to the rule that authority corrupts. It's a humanizing, characterizing moment for Stephen, which is reflecting another perspective on Nelson as an heroic figure. Perhaps there is more to explore there with Aubrey's knowing smile afterwards, whether that smile is uh, directed more towards his friend's classic cynicism, or, or perhaps if it's hiding some uh, truth that we aren't being told. Uh, the fact that this scene is immediately followed by everyone's favorite lesser of two weevils bit uh, may perhaps hint that even Nelson as a military man must face harsh realities, making difficult decisions, which had they not succeeded would have painted him as a villain and a fool rather than a heroic genius. And you know, maybe Aubrey is aware of that. Maybe he's seen something of Nelson that we don't know. Um, but if that is indeed what the filmmakers are hinting at, still I think they are doing so in a capacity, uh, that being hidden below the surface, that's still very appropriate for these characters, for Aubrey and all the others, um, as well as appropriate for this particular setting, uh, for the time period more broadly, and all that. Though I'm afraid we have not the time to delve into things quite so deeply as all that. I almost caught myself on a ramble there, I gotta be careful. For now, my dear viewers, a toast to Lord Nelson, his finest representation in film, and dare I say, to one of the most historically accurate and authentic films to have ever been made. For this is certainly the greatest way to create historical media, to mold one's characters and plot around the historical setting in which they are set, rather than bending the history wherever necessary to fit a story. By avoiding the direct showing of historical figures like Lord Nelson, 
Master and Commander ensures that he is, for us, the viewer, the exact same kind of figure as he would have been for the vast, vast, vast majority of his contemporaries. A man often talked of, even worshipped from afar, yet little known save through stories, images, and imagination. And among those who have seen him, every one has a story, an anecdote to tell of the time they held some glimpse of that greatness. And to make those glimpses humanizing while maintaining their historical accuracy by keeping them in a certain sense vague and personal, yes, but generic as well. And through that, able to tell just as much, if not more, about the person telling the story, about the person telling us about Nelson and their thoughts and experience of him, as it is of Nelson himself. When you outright show historical figures on the screen, you're running a risk. They might be an incredible actor who by their greatness ends up subverting the historical figure in our minds. Or perhaps even worse, they may be dealing with such an historically inaccurate script that even if they themselves are amazing actors, they're still going to end up replacing those very real figures with extreme caricatures. And it is in this way that by attempting to draw us closer to historical figures through on-screen appearances, so many films end up detracting from the historical reality. And whether we feel it consciously or, or not, are pulling us further away from better understanding those figures on their own terms and in their own context. Whereas, when you portray these figures in such a way as the majority of their contemporaries would have conceived of them through these little glimpses, where the emphasis is more on your own characters as they're navigating that historic environment, I dare say that you can actually give a clearer and infinitely more authentic and accurate view into exactly who those historical figures really were, why they matter, and how they came to hold the reputations which they have today. Because now, whenever I think of the Admiral Horatio Lord Nelson, I don't think of Christopher Plummer. I don't think of Martin Sheen. I don't think of Kieran Hines. I think of Nelson, of the portraits, of the statues, of the idea of what Nelson represents, just as so many of his own time did as well. So cheers, not to the actor, but to the Admiral, to Lord Nelson. To Lord Nelson. To Lord Nelson. Lord Nelson. Thank you also very much for watching. Of course, most particularly to my ever-beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com, for it is by virtue of your support that I am able to carry on with my work. Until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.